Ready. My name's Jeremy. I work for a company called Spark. We're a software development shop out of Charleston. Um, that doesn't have to mean anything to you because this talks about Node. Um, all right, real quick, just so I can get a feel for who's in the room, can you raise your hand if you uh, played with Node at all? All right, this is good. Um, how about if you've actually taken a Node project all the way through to production? All right, that's, that's good too. Last time I gave a talk like this, it was like 5%, so it's getting better. All right, um, who follows Horse.js? Uh, you may not know, but this is a, it's a parody account, but it's probably the single best way to keep tabs on what's going on in the Node.js community. Um, if you spent any time with Node, you've probably heard the expression call back hell. And if you haven't heard that one, you've heard the pyramid of doom. And we kind of have to ask ourselves, like, how bad can it really be? A lot of you just raised your hands. A lot of us are using Node. A lot of us have taken it all the way through to production. Uh, we're seeing bigger and bigger companies adopt Node. So what's everyone complaining about? Um, and we're going to kind of take a look at that. So let's define a simple task. We are going to open a file, we're going to write to it, and then we're going to close it. Everyone clear? So if we were to do this synchronously, uh, so we're just going to use the node sync operations. Let me see if this will let me get away with zooming in a bit. I don't know what that's going to do on the other slides, but we basically get our file descriptor. So we do an open sync, we do a write sync, and then we do a close sync, and then we're done. So if we add some error handling to that, it gets a little bit more complex, but it's still pretty straightforward. The semantics of the code are very close to the original semantics of the operations we're trying to complete. Let's see what happens if we do this asynchronously. And one thing we can tell right off the bat is we begin to immediately see this pyramid effect. I don't know where my mouse is. So every time we do an async operation, we pass in a callback and then we indent, and then we do a write operation, and then we indent. And you'll probably notice we're not actually doing anything with the errors yet, which is bad. So what happens if we actually add the error handling? And I'm not going to uh, waste everyone's time stepping through this line by line, but just in order to try and do this in a somewhat dry manner without doing repetitive error handling in every callback, we immediately get into this absolute massive ball of code bleed, or I bleed code. All right, so um, apparently it can get bad. And that's a very simple operation. Again, we're just opening a file, writing to it, and closing it. And so the next question then is, uh, why even bother with this? If it's that hard to write node code to this async operations, why are so many people using it? Um, so to answer that, uh, I don't know who all has seen Ryan Dahl's very original intro to Node.js talk. He gave this at a JSConf presentation back in 2009. And he basically had this slide, and it's been in almost every Node talk ever since. So I'm a sucker for tradition, so here it is. But um, what we're doing is looking at the IO latency of reading from various resources. So if you look at the L1 cache, L2 cache, RAM, those are all very fast. At this scale, they don't even register on the diagram. As soon as you get to disk and network, we're on the order of millions of times more expensive to read from those resources. And uh, what's important about that is it allows us to basically create this sort of very loosey-goosey definition around a blocking operation. And that's something where, if we're, uh, for example, trying to read from a resource, we're doing a lot of waiting. Um, so, yeah, here, here's just a, a quick code example. If we were trying to simply read something from memory, that's going to be, you know, I'm playing fast and loose with the numbers there, but it's roughly a million times faster than pulling that over the network. So the question is, what are we going to do with all that time? We're spending a lot of time waiting when we pull something off of disk or off of the network, and obviously we want to do some multitasking. We, um, we, we don't want to have the entire system completely unutilized during that time period. So if you're a PhD or even have a master's in computer science, just plug your ears for this part, because I'm going to completely screw this up. But that kind of takes us into this really big ongoing debate on how do you do multitasking. And the two big camps here are preemptive multitasking versus cooperative. All right. All right, here we go. Um, so 
when you're dealing with computers, you have finite resources. So you can't just um, give everyone who wants to use the disk access at the same time, everyone who wants to use the CPU access at the same time. And so imagine this intersection as a finite resource. So you have all these cars, and they're basically competing to try and use that intersection because they're all trying to you know, get where they're going. And they obviously can't all be there at the same time. All right, so preemptive multitasking. Imagine that you have some external scheduler that coordinates, all right, your turn, now it's your turn. It's basically a traffic light. And so it's going to turn red for one lane and say, okay, you guys are waiting. It's going to turn green for the others and say, okay, you're allowed to go. At some point, it's going to switch. And now the lane that was waiting, they can enter the intersection. Um, so, so there's a lot of sort of subtleties about this. But um, as we get into the code, we'll see that oftentimes it's easier to code using the preemptive pattern. Um, and uh, you know, if you take shared address spaces, you know, then all bets are off. But usually, you get better task isolation. So if one thing fails, uh, it doesn't absolutely mess up the rest of the system. Some of the cons are that you do have this dependency on an external scheduler which means you have less control over when those context switches happen. A car can't say, hey, I just, uh, you know, I'm done, so you can go ahead and flip that red, or I want to go, so flip it green. Um, and it's not free. So um, when you're talking about preemptive, you're usually talking about threads, and that scheduler is usually the operating system thread scheduler. Um, might be a runtime scheduler, like in green threads. But the idea is it's always external to the tasks themselves. and uh, operating system threads, for example, it depends, but that can be anywhere from two to eight megabytes of immediate stack allocation before you've even started getting work done. So it's not free. You've got this cost associated with having a preemptive model. All right, so let's look at the cooperative version. And so just like we saw with the traffic light, that was this external scheduler. If you were to think of a roundabout, you don't have that. There's nothing telling cars when to go, when to leave, and so... <laughs> I found these GIFs, and I'm forcing this entire analogy on top of them. But um, so one thing is that it's rel relatively efficient. You don't have any context switching involved. Um, you have full control over when that control is yielded. So that's a two-edged sword, though. So a car can enter whenever it wants. But what happens if a car just spends all day spinning round and round and round that roundabout? He's hogging that shared resource. And so, you know, bad apple can spoil the bunch. Everyone else is just waiting and saying, dude, this isn't fair. Um, and we'll, as we'll also see, the other side effect is it can often be harder to program these simple tasks. We just saw that with the um, open, right, closed test. All right, so real quick, what is Node use? Cooperative? Any, any other answers? Preemptive? I so see you're both right. Um, all right, so this is the event loop. You'll always hear about the event loop when you're talking about Node.js. And uh, you know, for a lot of Node developers, it's the sort of quasi thing that happens in the background because you never actually work with something called a loop. Or, um, but this is basically what's going on. All of your code is essentially a task, and that's going to get put at the very front of the event queue. So your code starts life off as a task in the event queue. The event loop is just sitting there basically in a busy cycle saying, hey, if there's anything in there, I'm going to run it. So let's say you have a task that needs to go read something from the disk. What it's going to do is pull that task off the event queue. It's going to run that code. Now you'll, you'll notice that in uh, like file system access, you're always running through this like C, you know, kind of like the dark corners of Node where we never look. But that's actually happening inside a thread pool. There, there's some context where even though Node works in this asynchronous non-blocking fashion, the operating system simply doesn't give you an API like that. So we actually run that in a preemptive model inside this thread pool. Once that's done, we take the result of that, put it in your callback, shove it back into the event queue, so then when it makes its way back to the event loop, you now resume control. So that's, uh, I hope that kind of makes sense, but that's the exchange between the uh, cooperative model, which is your code over in the event queue, and then the preemptive model, which is basically anything that Node can't actually do cooperatively. All right, so let's get back to the code. I promised we were going to look at the past, present, and future of asynchrony in Node.js. As a side note, I'm not even sure I'm using the word asynchrony right, but I like the word and the definitions were kind of vague. Um, 
But let's go back and look and see what we had in the very beginning. Um, I think we can say that Node was a pretty good idea from the get-go, but I don't know if we could say that about the API that it exposed. So this is uh, our open, right, close example again. And notice that we're basically creating this file abstraction. So we create this file object, and then we have this on error method to register our error handler. And it's kind of modeled after the old school window.on error from the DOM, except for we introduce camel casing. And then we get this method parameter, and that's going to tell us what method the error actually occurred in. So we can tell if it was the open or the write or the close. Uh, down below, we can open the file, write to it, close it. And what's interesting about this is you'll notice we're not dealing with any callbacks there at the bottom, even though they are asynchronously, uh, asynchronous. And what's happening is Node is actually queuing those operations for us. And, and, and again, this is way back in the day, um, June 2009. So it's queuing those operations for us. And then if an error happens, it goes up to our error handler. Um, this is a bonus. Here's another method. And uh, if it succeeds, we'll get some number uh, other than 0. And if it passes, we get 0. And that's just regular old um, you know, Unix style status codes. Um, but it's kind of hard to imagine that this came from the same API. It looks absolutely nothing like the previous slide. So basically, it was just trying to be too smart. It was trying to help you with, all right, callbacks kind of suck, so let's not make you do it for everything. That basically resulted in a bunch of one-off APIs where it tried to make every little scenario easier. Um, and that ultimately leads to error-prone code, because it's hard to predict, how do I handle an error here versus on that API? So we moved forward, um, and we had this new abstraction. And it wasn't actually called event promise emitters, but we had this really weird construct where it was like a promise object. It inherited from event emitters, and it would always return or always emit a success or an error event. And that's all it had. Uh, we didn't have the current dot on um, method signature that Node has today. So if you wanted a success callback, you did add callback. If you wanted an error callback, it was add error back. Um, so this actually was an improvement because we were at least consistent at this point. Didn't matter what asynchronous operation you were trying to do, you could always count on that basically being your, your method signature. Uh, on the downside, the promise implementation was very half-baked. So if you look at a lot of the promises libraries today, we're trying to achieve things like some sort of composability, and, and they have all these nice utility methods. This had none of that. Um, it, you could argue that it wasn't even really promises. Um, and also around the same time, it was basically decided that the Node core project should stay very minimal, as unopinionated as possible. And it was basically decided that something like promises was just too opinionated for core. So they had to go. Um, that basically takes us to the API that we had today. And so this should actually look a lot more familiar. Um, as a side note, this is all you're trying to do. There's actually like a write file method. So use that one instead, but I'm just trying to demonstrate multiple operations here. Um, so the current API is you do an asynchronous operation. You pass in an error first callback, which simply means that you expect any error that may have occurred as the first parameter. Any results are going to be subsequent parameters. And uh, this kind of takes us into pyramid land. Um, so you know the pros are it is consistent. Uh, it's minimal and unopinionated. Uh, as we just saw, if you're not careful, you do kind of get into this pyramid callback hell world. Uh, but the good thing was this clearly defined control flow as a concern for user land, which there's, uh, as we'll actually see right here, um, the user community decided that there's a lot of good ways to go about asynchronous control flow. And, and that's not even all of them. That's still not all of them. Um, but th there's a lot of good ideas out there, and you might have your preference, and someone else can have their preference, and you don't want no deciding that for you. So it's actually a good thing. Um, so bottom line is there's more than one way to skin a callback. At least he thought it was funny. All right. Um, but seriously, uh, promises versus callbacks. This is the debate that just goes on and on and on. If you search for promises, no JS on Twitter, You'll never get to the end of it. And um, so basically, as you look at all of these different asynchronous libraries and modules that have been created, 
you'll kind of see two different camps. There's those that embrace the callback method signature of Node, and they, decide, uh, they, they try to build better abstractions on top of that. And there's those that just say callbacks is just a bad idea. It's not how it's meant to be done. We should use promises. And uh, that's kind of your two big camps. So we're going to spend a little time comparing them. You could honestly have an entire conference on promises. Um, so we're going to try and get through this quickly. But um, a promise essentially represents the eventual value returned from a single completion of an operation, which we'll actually see what that means. Um, so if we did like a synchronous version of this operation, we're going to create a random number, double it, and then log it. So the, the synchronous version is very easy to, to code, to read, to reason about. Um, if you were to do this with callbacks, you, we'd have you know, at least one level of nesting. And if our double operation was asynchronous, we'd have another. Um, promises try to alleviate that through this idea of saying, just return my value right away. You don't need to provide me a callback. And eventually, when I, can, when I complete, you can basically register how to handle that using this then method. And that, and that dot then is probably the one thing that almost all these promises libraries have in common. Um, all right, so let's define a new task so we can actually compare these better. This time, we're going to read a URL that's stored in this URL.txt file. We're going to download the contents of that file, and then we're going to save them back to URL contents.txt. So if you look at the plain old callbacks version, um, it's more or less what we expect. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, we're going to read the file. Within our callback, we'll handle the error. We'll get the, uh, we'll get the actual page, handle the error, write it to the file, handle the error. Um, so and it's straightforward. It's just way too much indentation for something this simple. Uh, a lot of duplicated error handling, and there's obviously room for improvement. So let's look at async.js. And I'm using this as sort of our representative of the callbacks uh, utility library. So this is a library that tries to take the actual callback system that Node has and builds on top of that rather than saying, no, we need this you know, whole other way of doing things. And it basically defines a bunch of useful abstractions on top of that. So what Waterfall does is allows you to define a sequence of operations. And it will provide a async provided callback. See if I can find my cursor again. Oh, no. Um, I'll leave the cursor alone. Um, so you, uh, and that follows the regular node signature. So it's an error first callback. So if read file, which is expecting a node style callback, provides an error, that's going to get passed all the way down to the end. Um, any non-error parameters get passed to the next function, so on and so forth. So it's basically kind of like the waterfall style of uh, software development. You don't start one step until you finish the previous one. And if anything went horribly wrong, you don't find out till the very end. All right, so it avoids pyramids. Um, it's easier to restructure because we don't have all this crazy indentation going on. Uh, there's no duplication of the error handling. Uh, but again, it still seems like there's got to be room for improvement. We're doing a three-step operation here. It's, it's hard to believe that's as good as it gets. Oh my. There we go. See, there's our eventual completion. Um, all right, so let's see how promises do. We're going to look at the cube promise library, which uh, is probably the most popular one out there if you just look at GitHub stars. And uh, so again, like we said, it more or less fights against the node convention, which is not really the fault of promises because they weren't specifically built for node. But it needs a return value of a promise. And so what we basically do is take that read file, write file, get methods, and we wrap it inside this helper that will make it match kind of that promise you know, return contract. And so we'll notice that, um, so we'll read the file, and it actually returns a promise. So instead of passing in a callback, we call dot then on the return value. That allows us to handle the eventual completion of it. And then we basically chain those then commands. Um, any errors will be passed all the way forward until we provide a second callback to dot then, which is basically your way of saying, OK, here's like a error completion handler. Um, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, 
It avoids pyramids. Uh, the nice thing is it's pretty composable because you can really just pass these promises around and they're um, easy to reason about. There's no duplication of the error handling. Um, as a downside, it's not really the fault of promises, but if you're dealing with Node, it, it is tedious to wrap this callback-based code. So just real quick to compare these. Uh, they all have different approaches, but there's one thing that's still in common across all of these, and you can't get away from the fact that you're passing these functions around, right? So e even with the promises, they say, oh, we get rid of callbacks, technically, but you know, they just call it a completion handler instead, right? So moral of the story, you can chain them, you can pass them, you can name them, you can call them whatever you want. You simply can't do async in JavaScript without passing functions around. Or can we? OK, so this is going to take us into uh, the future. Um, and this is near future. So this is actually a quote from a guy from the turn of the previous century. He was talking about the USSR. So really doesn't have anything to do with this talk, um, other than the fact that just like him, I'm rather optimistic about the future right now. Um, and one reason for that is ES6 generators. So before we can talk about generators in particular, there's a few concepts we need to understand. And one is what an iterator is. Uh, so Wikipedia defines it as an object that, encaps, uh, that enables a programmer to traverse a container. That's a little abstract. So let's talk about JavaScript iterators in particular. It's basically an object that gives you a next method. You can keep calling that over and over again. Every time you call it, you're going to get a tuple that has your value for that iteration. And then assuming it's a finite or, or a, a limited sequence, you'll eventually get that done flag set to true, and then you know you're, yeah, there's no more values. Um, all right, so generator functions. We're going to talk about it more in a second, but it's basically a special type of function that makes it easier to create iterators. So here's an example. And uh, so this, uh, I think I got it in the slide, but this is actually in Node right now if you use like the latest unstable versions. Um, you'll notice that the yield keyword is new. Um, it wasn't a reserved word in the past, and because of that, they basically had to then add this star to the function, and that disambiguates it. It wasn't yield or wasn't reserved before, so now they know if it's inside a function star, uh, it's got the special meaning now. And we'll call hello world generator here, and that doesn't actually run that function body yet. So this is where we first take our major departure from regular functions. All it does is get back our iterator. So that's what I mean when I say a generator function is just a way to get iterators. Uh, we'll call dot next on that. And we'll get our first value, hello, which is the value we yielded from up above. We're not done yet, so we can call dot next again. We get world, we're not done yet. Call it again, our value is undefined, and done is true. So that's basically generator functions. Um, it's not that interesting though, right? So we could have just created an array with hello world and then done like a forward loop on it, right? So let's look where it starts to get a little bit more interesting, at least within the context of async coding. So notice that our generator function hasn't changed at all. But down below, we're calling dot next. We get our hello value, and then we do a set timeout. And now a full second later, we're actually going to call dot next again and get our world value. This is actually a pretty stinking huge deal in JavaScript, because you'll notice we had this yield hello, yield world. There's a full second in between those. And prior to generators, there is simply no way natively within the language to have a pause like that and still have the pseudo-synchronous syntax. This is still happening. Uh, it's fully non-blocking. It's asynchronous. asynchronous. We're not um, doing like a busy wait in between those. Um, so, And that's pretty cool. That's new stuff. But the stuff down here kind of sucks. So that, that's a lot of work to go through just to get rid of a callback, right? So uh, what's happening now is a lot of libraries are coming out to make this easier. Um, this is the part where I'm going to kind of toot my own horn for a minute. Um, so Spend is a library I put out to actually help with dealing with generators for async control flow. So uh, here's a very simple example. Um, it's basically the previous example, but um, using just Suspend. And what we'll see is you basically just take a generator function, you wrap it in Suspend, and then assuming you're working with callbacks, it gives you this resume parameter that you can provide in place of it. So 
we've got a full second in between those statements, no callbacks involved. That's you know pretty new for most of us JavaScript developers. All, all the people from the preemptive you know, multitasking world are like, that's not a big deal. <laughs> but <laughs> um, anyways, so let's go back to our test real quick. Um, so we're going to read the URL, download the contents, write the contents to the file. This is the suspend version. And you'll notice that we've actually gotten pretty close in terms of having the code actually match the exact semantics of what we need without all this extra callback noise or, or dot bends and things like that. So um, no pyramids, no callbacks. Um, I didn't really highlight it there, but if you have an error that happens, uh, these wrapper libraries like suspend can actually throw it back inside that generator function body. So you can use try catches again. You can use for loops. You can actually code with those async method calls just like you do any other method call. Um, the resume parameter makes it easy to integrate with error first callbacks. The downside is it's sort of hacked on top of generators. It's not really what they were built for. They kind of had this in mind because, like, the Python community, they've been doing this for a long time. But, um, you know, it, you still kind of have this hacky feel when you walk away from it. Um, as a side note, this actually works with promises as well. And this is, um, I definitely recommend, uh, Forbes Lindsay just gave a talk at JSConf. The video and slides are posted now. But it's basically how generators plus uh, promises arrive at this control flow utopia. And it's definitely true. And one of the things that he highlights a lot, um, if you look at the callback based code, one of the downsides is you really mix your input parameters with your output parameters, which is kind of a code smell. So you, you provide your parameters to the method, so I, I want to asynchronously double something, so I pass in two. And then just to get control back, I also pass in this callback. So I've now got this parameter I'm passing in that's only associated with just getting control back, and, and that kind of sucks. Promises actually get us away from that because uh, this is a mongoose method. If you don't pass a callback to exec, it returns a promise instead. So I get my promise back. I haven't given anything to it as far as um, you know, a continuation, but I can still work with a generator like this. And so it really is a pretty cool method. Um, I'm just going to say he, he did say that Suspend was the most ingenious library he's seen in the last year, and then he spent the next minute trash talking it. So when, when he starts talking good about it, hit pause real quick. <laughs> um, so there's some other libraries that basically do the same thing as Suspend, though. So Co is probably the most popular one out there. It's written by TJ Hollowaychuk, um, the creator of Express and Stylus and Jade and another 200 modules. Um, and then GenRun and Jenny are also pretty interesting as well. All right, so when can I see them? You can actually kind of start using them now. They're, they're not in a stable version of Node yet. Uh, they will be in Node v0.12. Uh, but they'll probably still be hidden behind the Harmony generators flagged by V8. Um, you can actually use them in Chrome if you enable the experimental JavaScript features, and they actually just landed a week or two ago in Firefox Nightlies. All right, so that takes us to uh, future. And I, I had to specially designate this as the speculative future because this isn't in any sort of a standard draft yet. Well, sort of. ES6 promises. This is actually very likely to happen. Um, yeah, just not in the draft yet, but they're, they're getting pretty close to reaching a consensus. Uh, so we, we just showed some of the cool benefits of using promises and being able to combine them with generators. And it seems like if Node were to actually use promises itself, it'd make a lot of things easier because then you don't have to do all that ugly wrapping stuff. Um, so the question is, are they going to actually show up in Node core now that they'll be a part of the language? Um, so Isaac Suter, he's the current uh, maintainer of Node. And he said that version one is actually going to be a major rewrite that's going to focus on integrating promises into Node Core. Um, those of you who have been following the conversation are probably surprised by that, and you should be, because um, when I asked him what he actually said was pick the answer that made me feel best, and I can say that. Um, he, he just said just to make him sound smart and insightful. So um, hopefully this recording doesn't get out. Uh, but anyway, so promises probably won't end up in Node Core, um, and if they do, the, the hard, fast rule is that it's going to maintain backwards compatibility. Once Node hits a version 1.0, um, they're not interested in having like a PHP 6 type situation where you know, the whole rug gets pulled out under your carpet, under your feet. All right, so um, next we're going to talk about 
async and await in ES7. And so I've really got a warn here. We're, we're really just kind of guessing what this is going to look like. This is pieced together from um, conversations in the ES discuss forum. But um, it's actually really cool, and I think it's worth talking about uh, TC39, the working group that standardizes ECMAScript, which is what JavaScript is based on, um, has definitely been getting a lot of feedback on how annoying it is to work with async stuff. So they are trying to work with the community and make this easier. Um, so here's what a uh, current proposal looks like. And you'll notice that um, we still have this sort of funky thing off the function that tells us that this isn't a regular function. And then we get this cool await keyword. So this is kind of like async and await from C Sharp and uh, various other languages. Um, and you can basically expect it to look almost like using generators with suspend, except for you don't have to actually wrap it inside of a library like suspend. So the nice thing is you get all the benefits of using something like generators and suspend, but it's not a hack on top of generators. It's actually meant for this. So um, real quick, just to wrap things up, uh, I sort of dogged on it early on, but it's worth pointing out there are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of modules out there meant to make working with async in Node easier. And, and it really is quite manageable today. I probably don't really have to tell this crowd that since so many of you are using it. Um, ES6 generators are a pretty powerful new tool. I just focus on how they're useful for async stuff. They've got a whole bunch of other useful, um, useful capabilities, like when you get into the more functional paradigm. Um, and then this is really interesting that ES6 promises are going to actually appear in the JavaScript language. This is basically proof that the community works. It's proof that TC39 is exceptionally responsive to the concerns and uh, direction that the community has taken. They're really just cave, uh, paving a cow path here. And uh, ES7 is seriously going to blow our minds. I, I gave a sneak peek at the async await thing. If you ever get a chance, go check out the ECMAScript wiki. It's just full of interesting proposals and stuff for ES7. And uh, it's going to hardly even look like the same language by the time they're done, but some really cool stuff um, coming our way. So um, I don't know where we are on time, but I assume we have time for questions. we got five minutes. <laughs> Right. Um, right, so yeah, the kind of question was I said that it was a hack on top of generators, so what are they actually for? And then you mentioned like lazy sequence generation, for example. And that is one of the things that they're meant for. Um, so uh, I showed kind of that yield expression. If I wanted to, I could have a um, while true loop that just yields values. Um, so it could be um, I just yield the, the next double and the next double and the next double. And then you could create a take method and say, just, you know, I'm going to take the first 200 or first 1,000. And I can do that without actually computing all 1,000 of them up front. It's not going to get generated until I call dot next again. So it is great for lazy sequences. Um, generator functions are just one way to create them. But we're also going to get. Uh, generator expressions, which is a much more terse syntax, which is going to look familiar to um, Scala and Clojure and you know uh, developers from other languages. Uh, it hasn't been as popular in like the C family languages, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how that mixes in JavaScript. Um, so I have not used that library. Fibers are interesting, and they're another approach to get the synchronous looking code and still actually do true non -block blocking asynchronous code. The, um, the main reason I don't recommend fibers is they're not actually part of the language, and so it's not portable. So eventually, things like generators and promises and async and await, it's all going to be in the browser as well. So you can hack fibers on top of Node if you want, but yeah, you know, that's where it's going to stay. Yeah. With which one? Um.
Well, well, I think the general principle would be that if you can solve your problem using the tools of the language itself, you know, that's definitely a path of much less resistance than trying to actually hack the runtime to add new features. You know, the you know, V8, the API could change and now all your code's busted because you tried to hack threads or fibers or you know, something else on top of it. So um, yeah, so the event loop in Node that runs in a single thread, um, single process and all that, what you can do is you can spin up multiple node processes if you want, and there's lots of interesting ways to communicate with them. Uh, it actually shifts with a cluster module out of the box for doing that. So that's you know, definitely the difference between concurrency and you know, parallel execution, actually doing two things truly at once. And so yeah, one way is just to spin up multiple node processes. Uh, ES7 actually has some proposals for doing that natively within the language itself. Uh, it's another interesting thing to check out. All right, so I think we're maybe time for one more question. All right, maybe that's it. All right, thanks. <laughs> mm -hmm.